Welcome, everyone. I'm really nervous. <laughs> um, I want to introduce a few people. First, I will start with the band so Tara can sit down. Lovely singer, Tara Quick. On the keys, we have Levi Werner. On the bass, we have John Epson. On the drums, we have Jesus Velasquez. And on guitar, we have Mo Perdomo. And they're sitting down because the concert's over. Thanks, guys. I also want to introduce my hubby. Hi. Hi. That's Ricky. And then my little daughter. Is she in here or is she being a pill? There she is. If you hear crying, it's probably from her. Okay. This is my story. This is why we're here. I was raised in a Christian household with two very loving, wonderful parents. And uh, I really didn't make my faith my own until I was in college. In 2008, I met a really cute guy at Hume Lake when I was working there, and he was working there. In 2010, he proposed. In 2000, no, 2009, he proposed. 2010, we got married. 2011, I found out he was a drug addict. And that's why we're here, because I married a drug addict. But the good news is, God intervened. I found out a year into marriage that my husband was addicted to painkillers. And that started a very long and painful road after that. Um, he was going through withdrawals when we went on a cruise to Alaska. And withdrawals look a lot like the flu, and that's what he told me he had. He just had the flu. And then after that, he uh, told me, hey, I've been addicted. This is what's been going on, but I'm ready to get clean. I'm ready to live for the Lord. I'm ready to be the spiritual leader that I know you've needed forever. And that's what I like craved to hear. I wanted a spiritual leader. And so him telling me that was like, whoa, cool. Like I almost didn't even hear that he just said he was addicted to drugs because he was going to be a spiritual leader now and it was just going to be awesome. I wish I knew about addiction and what that truly meant. My only, my only experience with drugs is being offered pot once in seventh grade. And I said no. So that's basically all I knew. I didn't know anything about relapse or anything like that. We were um, living in Bakersfield at the time. That's Ricky's hometown. And I don't even think it was weeks after he came clean to me that he did, in fact, relapse. A lot, a lot happened there in Bakersfield that I can't get into tonight because there's just no time. But um, there was a lot of anger. There were a lot of fights. He threw a chair across the living room one time, and that's when I got really scared. He never once touched me. It never escalated to that. But it was not a good situation. And um, he was spending our money recklessly. And I told him, if this keeps up, like I'm going to open my own bank account. I'm going to put my money in there and you're not gonna have any access to it. And he said, well, if you do that, that means I can't trust you. And so if you follow through with that, then I'm gonna leave you. And that scared me back into compliance and I felt stuck. So right now, this is the longest chunk of time that I'm gonna speak. And I'm not gonna get into everything, obviously, but it is important for you guys to know what we went through so you can understand what we were redeemed from. We moved from Bakersfield, drug world, which is what I call it now, um, here to Escondido. This is my hometown. And when we moved here, I drew a line mentally in my head saying, if drugs surfaced in Escondido, something major would have to happen. I don't know what it would be, but just obviously he can't kick it. So if they surface again, something will have to happen. Things did get better for a little bit, at least a few months. He got a job, I got pregnant, and things were seemingly normal. But somewhere along my pregnancy, it started up again. He had um, back 
something, he hurt his back and he had some dental work done and was given painkillers for that and just started back up again. And my family tried telling me, hey, I see the behavior, they knew the history, could he be back on drugs? And I was just like, no, no. Like, he wouldn't do that to our family again. And I was definitely in denial. And the problem with being in denial, you can't tell a person who's in denial that they're in denial. Because they're not going to believe you. It usually takes something drastic happening in your life to wake you up. And that's happened a few times for me. But then again, he's always relapsed. And so this last time, <laughs> what it took was on July 7th, 2014, eight police officers came to our apartment with a warrant to search the premises and arrested Ricky in front of me and my eight-month-old daughter. Sitting on that couch, him handcuffed, Charlie on my lap, and police officers searching our house is not something I'm going to be forgetting anytime soon. The detective wasn't able to talk to me that moment. They had to take him down and question him. But the next day, he called me and he told me exactly why they arrested him. And it had been an ongoing investigation about how he was obtaining drugs illegally. And in that conversation, it was like a whole slew of feelings. First, it was like, I was so sad. I was so mad. Like, really, he did this again? But then immediately, because I had mentally drawn that line and it was confirmed by the detective, yes, he's back on drugs, it was like the easiest decision to be like, okay, he can't live with us anymore until it gets well. While he was in jail, I told him that he couldn't live with us anymore and that made him mad. And I told him I wouldn't bail him out again because it wasn't my responsibility. He got himself there. It wasn't going to be my debt. I say again, because I told you, a lot happened. And this was his third arrest. And I had bailed him out the first two times. And literally, like, weeks before this happened, I had just finished paying off the last debt of bail. So I wasn't going to do it again. He had to do what he had to do, pay the consequences for his actions. And it made him really mad. Um, he tried every manipulation tactic in the book to get me to bail him out and to get me to let him come home. And it was hard. I had a great support system that I went to almost on a daily basis, like, okay, give me the strength. Help me know what I should do. And certain people were very um, just awesome through this process, like reminding me, hey, this is his deal, not yours. At the same time that he was in jail, we were being evicted out of our apartment because the rent money that I had given him didn't make it to the rental office. And because I didn't have an extra $1,200 to pay for rent, we got evicted. So he was in jail and I was trying to clear out our apartment. My mom and family were amazing through this time. I was just basically on autopilot. I just was so everywhere. Um, and I didn't know what to do. Um, we moved in with my parents because God is awesome and provided that for us. The timing there was incredible. But my husband was in the county jail. I was getting rid of almost everything we owned. And I asked a few people, what's my role as a Christian wife to my husband in this situation? Like, what am I supposed to do? And it was actually my brother who ended up answering encouragement. It is your job to not only encourage him that he can do this, he can get well, but that you're also going to be there with him through it. So in the month that he was in jail, the only way I knew I could show him that I was there for him was visiting him. And so in that month, I visited him four times. He didn't really care if I came. He was so mad. He was like, you don't love me. This isn't love. You know, the, he didn't care if I was there, and I was like, I do love you. This is how I'm showing you. I can't show you the way you want me to show you. I know you want me to bail you out, but that's not going to happen. But I'm still here for you. And it was a long month. Um, towards the end of his jail experience is when he realized, I've got to do something or else I'm going to lose my family forever. 
So when he got out of jail, he um, had an intake interview into Teen Challenge. And there's a couple Teen Challenge guys here. Um, Teen Challenge is a year-long faith-based drug and alcohol rehabilitation program. And I went with him to the intake interview. While he was in the interview, I was sitting out in the lobby with Charlie, and this guy walked by and said, is that your husband in there? And I said, yeah, it is. And he said, is he hoping to get in the program? I said, yeah, definitely. And he said, today? I said, hopefully. And he walked away. And it turned out that because that guy intervened in the interview, Ricky was able to get into the program. Totally a God thing. Um, nice. I agree, Charlie girl. The fingerprints of God are just totally in the entire story of ours. We now lived separately. He was in Teen Challenge. I was at my parents. And we, for the first time, were in a place individually that we could start growing and building the foundation of our individual spiritual lives for the first time in a long time. And it took separating to get to the place where we both could work on our relationship with God individually so that when we came back together, it would be something that would allow us to be in a marriage that would glorify the Lord because we would know how to this time. During that year-long program, I sought comfort in my music. I've written songs since I was like 11 years old. And I just started writing as soon as he got in the program. And the topics would come out of whether, like, Ricky and I would talk about something, if he was learning something, something I was learning, and just another song would get written. And it was really important for me to do this tonight because our story is one that God just shines through, and I want people to know what he's done. And so that's the reason for tonight. This next song is a, a song that I wrote to Ricky, and um, I wrote it the, the fourth day that he was in the program. So he went in the program. Charlie and I left. We went home. That was a long car ride, lots of tears. Day one, day two, day three, day four, I wrote this song, and it was just how I was feeling in that moment. This song is one that I wrote to Ricky.
so I went to Teen Challenge on Family Day, and I played that song for Ricky. And there was like a little crowd gathering. It was kind of weird. But um, <clears throat> the next time I was able to see him was like two weeks later. And he came to me with a piece of paper and said, here, I wrote this in response to the song that you wrote me. Can you put it to music? I said, sure. So that's what this next song is. And um, these are his words. And ideally, a male vocalist should sing it. But I'm going to do it. And uh, just remember, it's, there's words like, my wife. Yeah, this is Ricky talking. <laughs> these songs came from actual conversations that I had with Ricky about what he was learning. And this next one is a conversation that he had about 
learning that we are not going to probably be attacked on Sundays when we're ready for it and we go to church and we've opened our Bibles and we're good to go for that day. When it's going to happen is during the week when we're not prepared and maybe not reading our Bibles. And so just learning the importance of putting on that armor of God every single day and not just being a Sunday soldier. Thing that we've learned all too real is uh, that things are going to happen in our lives that we can't change or predict or get rid of, erase from our minds. Something like this, you know, leaves mental scars and something that uh, it's going to it's a process to get over. Some things happen to us that leave physical scars, that it's a constant reminder, it's always there. And if you don't let those things be used for good, then they're just gonna stay down deep inside of you and cause nothing but bad. And it's something that no matter what happens in our lives, God can take those things and use them to glorify himself. And he can take any story of ours and make a testimony out of it. And that's what this next song's about. Sometimes we go through things that we would never choose for ourselves. Sometimes we see certain things that we just can't stop or help. Why do these happen? Is there a reason or a right? Now I have permanent scars that remind me all the time. 
You took my wounds and you made a witness. You took my scars and you let them sing. You took my life and you gave it light. No more will darkness ring. You took my anger and you softened me. You took my heart. always wanted to write a Christmas song. So last Christmas, I was like writing all these songs, and I was like, I want to write a Christmas song. So I did. And it's just meant to be fun and maybe a good reminder. So, and next month's Christmas, so I can get away with this.
Part of my growth this last year has uh, been my prayer life and just how important it is to pray and to talk to God and to tell him what's going on and to lean on him and to listen to him. That process has gotten a little better throughout the, the last year. And uh, I wanted to write a song that was a prayer to the Lord. And I'm like, how do I even go about starting a song like that? And I remembered when I was in high school, at the high school group here at church, um, they taught us a way to pray. This isn't the magical words or anything, but it's just a way if you don't know how to start or what to say. And it uses the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S. And A is for adoration, giving praise to God. C is confession, confessing our sins and all the wrongs we've done. T is for thanksgiving, thanking him for Everything he's ever done, which is a lot. And S is supplication, humbly asking for the things we want. So I had that acronym in mind when I wrote the song, so I took on that name, Axe.
Miss Tara has been sick all week. She missed practice on Tuesday because she was sick, and she just did amazing. So band, we're going to take a slight break. I um, have shared with you in, through my words our story, but I want Ricky to come up here and talk to you guys um, his testimony, his story, how God changed his life, and where he's at with that right now. 
Ricky? All right, so I'm mic'd. I'm not used to it, so you're going to have to bear with me. Hi, I'm Ricky, or Richard, as Teen Challenge knows me. Hey, guys. I'm really glad they're here because you guys get to see the other side of the story, the other side of the mountain you're about to climb, uh, the one that looks terrible and frightening and the one that, that you think you can't do. And to be honest by yourself, you cannot do it. I tried. Not that I'm the best out there, but I tried hard. I, I, was, I, I was raised in a... Christian home. What I mean by that is my mom preached Jesus. She read the Bible. We went to church on Sundays and Wednesdays, Awanas. We did all of that stuff. But my home was broken. I had like four or five stepdads before my mom kicked me out. Now, she, she knew that Jesus was the answer, and she knew that we should be living that way, so she gave that to her kids. But she didn't live it out. We're known by our fruit, and her fruit just doesn't show it, and mine didn't either. Because she taught me how to fake it. She taught me how to be a great liar. Now, she didn't mean to, but if you're not going to live out your life the way the Bible tells us to, then what you become is a hypocrite. And it's why a lot of people leave the church, is because people don't live out their faith. My mom's not responsible for my actions. What I chose to do instead of trying to find faith, what I chose to do instead of reading the Bible with my heart or trying to change my life, what I chose to do is find something to numb it. And drugs are a big thing in a lot of people's lives. It's rampant, and there's a lot of people struggling with it, and they don't know how to fix it, and it's because they can't. But I, I thought that if I didn't feel certain feelings, I would be okay. And for me, it just took one time. I, I took pills one time, painkillers, and I was hooked. My addiction started way before Kim, about six years before her. And she met me at Hume Lake where I had a brief stint of clean. And I was clean because there was nothing on the hill. We were three hours from everything. There was nothing for me to do. I, I mean, had it been there, I probably would have still had a problem, but I was able to live clean and imitate the Christian life. And she saw something in me, and God knows I don't know what that was, but... Um, she saw something within me, and, and we began to date. I came back off the hill, back into real life, where these things are available again. And I knew people, and I got right back into it like it never stopped. And I hid it from her because I knew inherently those things are wrong. You're not supposed to take pills. You're not supposed to get high. You're supposed to love Jesus and, and pray. And those are the only words I knew. But th I knew them to be true. But... Uh, I hid it from her during our dating and our, our, uh, before we got married. I don't think she had any idea. At that time, I was managing it. So I was buying enough pills to stay level because at a certain point, I don't know if you guys know this, how familiar you guys are with addiction, but you have to take a certain amount to be high. But then after a while, pills don't do anything for you because your body has acclimated. And you have to take more just to stay level. And what I mean by that is function. If you're not taking enough, you don't function. You get sick and you stay in bed, you're tired and you're angry. So you have to take enough just to stay functional. And that's what I was doing. I was managing it. So it wasn't even about the high anymore. Now it was about staying level and, and being a husband for her. And uh, this is how crazy it gets. In a, in a drug addict's mind, this is how crazy it gets. I told myself I was doing it for her. Now let me connect these dots for you because that's crazy and I know. That's just nuts. Why would I do it for her? She doesn't want me doing that, right? She wants me to be a God-fearing man and I was too busy trying to do this for her. But... I figured she doesn't want to see me go through withdrawals. I'm a terrible person when, I'm, when that's happening, and I, I argue with her, I'm mean to her, but when I'm taking pills, I'm nice to her, and I function, and I clean the house, and do all kinds of other crazy, like clean for four hours straight. It's crazy. I don't know. It's just, I thought she liked that. And, and in my mind, so I would take these pills so that she would see the better side of me. And, and, and so in my mind, I, had, I connected those dots where, okay, now I can justify this addiction I'm doing it for her. Crazy. But in that moment, when you decide that it's justified, you kind of lose all control. As soon as you justify your addiction, you lose control. Because I have a reason. I have a reason to do it. And it's just, I mean, it's right. I'm doing it for her. So then it just went way off the deep end, spending all kinds of money. And pills are expensive when they're not in prescription form. Well, they're all prescription. I mean, off the street or whatever, off from friends or what have you. And then I started getting arrested, and that's not fun. 
I, I uh, got arrested three times. Uh, the second time, uh, I was mugged, and, and when the police came uh, to ask about it, they ran my name, and there was a warrant out for me, so I got mugged and then arrested right before Christmas, but uh, she bailed me out that time. Still, again, I, I don't know why. Yeah, thank you. But, you know, she did something eventually that would change my life forever, something my family had decided to do long ago. They had written me off in my mind. I, I thought of them as anti-Christian because they weren't loving me or accepting me the way I was. But what they were trying to do was show me tough love, and I wasn't accepting it. But what she eventually did, which changed my life, is she left me in jail. I was getting prescriptions from my neighbor and uh, filling them for him and keeping part of it. We had a deal with money and whatever. One day, he has uh, conviction about it. Without telling me, he turns himself in, and um, the police showed up at my door a few months later after they had been tracking me. Now, it's not his fault. You know, he, was, he actually did the right thing, and it actually did better for me than he would ever know, but I was very angry about that in jail. But uh, I called my wife to bail me out. She wouldn't do it. Called my mom. She wouldn't do it. Called my family. They said, no, you're staying there. This is the third time. You're staying in jail this time. So I had a court hearing in San Diego, and... When that was finished and sentenced, I had another one in Bakersfield, so they kept me to transfer me. That, that's what took most of the time, is transferring from San Diego to Bakersfield took about a week. I, you go to jails along the way and spend the night. It's just an awesome trip. Just, I recommend it. No, don't, don't do that. I'm just kidding. It was terrible. But at one of those jails, something, uh, uh, something terrible happened. Um, well, actually, two things. We'll start with the biggest one, and then ease out of it with the other one. She told me, you're not coming home. I'm taking the daughter. You're not safe for your daughter. You're not safe for our home. And I, I'm not letting you come back. So even if you get out of jail, you're not coming home. And I was broken. I realized what was going on. I was clean enough to, to see my actions, the results of everything. I was clean enough to know that the 5,000 courts after me are probably right. I, I was clean enough to know that I was dead right there in my sin. And I knew she was leaving, and I, I gave her, like she said, manipulation. I gave her anger. I gave her guilt trips. I gave her everything, and she stood her ground. And I'll never be more thankful for that moment when everything was gone, because it's at that moment that Jesus found me, and he began to restore me. Um, the second thing was, uh, uh, in jail, there's politics, and, and I know uh, probably a few of you guys are familiar with that, but there's politics in jail. Um, you don't converse with other races. Everything's real segregated. I didn't know that stuff still existed, but when I got to jail, I found out real quick because um, my people, the Woods, decided to tattoo me, to mark me, because I had shared food with a paisa. I was, thought I was being nice. But uh, you don't do that in jail. Um, uh, it was one of the most powerless few minutes of my life. Um, and that, that song that she sang about scars that, that have a testimony, that's one of mine. Is I still have the tattoo, it's on my wrist. And at first I wanted to remove it, but now it talks about what God can do with a life once everything is taken and once you decide to obey and submit, what he can do with somebody. And now it has become part of my testimony of the power that, that is in his forgiveness and grace. So I'm in jail, I get out of jail, and everybody's telling me you need a program, and I decide, okay, I need a program. Uh, I looked into Teen Challenge. I know it's called Teen Challenge. I thought it was for younger people. It's not. Turns out it's for uh, just anyone addicted to anything, which is great. That fit my bill. And I went in for an interview, and I had Hector in San Diego. He was my advisor. I interviewed with Hector, and these guys are from San Diego. That's why I point. Anyway, uh, I interviewed with Hector. He is the intake interview guy. He, he decides if you can come in or not. And the only things that would restrict you from coming in is if you still have court dates and if there's still like warrants out for you, you have to have a physical done. That's, and, and then after that, it's, you're pretty much in the doors if you want to be there. Now, I had court dates. I had not done a physical. These things were on me. I, I, he wasn't going to let me in. Then Herlindo, the director of San Diego Teen Challenge, talked to my wife out in the foyer saying, is that your husband in there? Would you like to come in today? And she, she said, yes. He comes into the interview and says, are you ready? And I said, yeah, I'm ready. He said, okay, Hector, let him in. 
He didn't ask any other questions. That's all he wanted to know. Was I, was I ready? And, and you know, the, the, the truth of it is I was. I knew I needed help. But in that day, I, I didn't know Jesus yet. Now, I've known of him for a long time, but that wasn't the, the moment. It was a couple weeks later in chapel singing songs about breaking chains. And I broke down and cried an honest cry for the first time in years. I poured out my heart and, and I asked God to take control of my life. I, I didn't know this at the time, but he already had a long time ago. It took control of my life. He wasn't going to let me go. But I asked him and I submitted. And then this is the good part. So that's all the terrible stuff. The good, the good part is from that moment on, our God is a God of restoration He believes in reconciliation, and he works very hard to make sure that happens. My wife sitting here is proof of that. I put her through enough for her to say, okay, I'm done. And no one would have blamed her. Everyone on earth would have said, finally, you left him. That would have been the response. But no, she stuck it out because she believed that God had control. And she was right. So I did my, I started going through the program. I started trying to be obedient and it took some work. And this is encouragement for you guys. It takes pure obedience. Even when you think you're right, obeying anyway. Uh, that's a tough one. Because I thought I was right a lot. And I'm not. But after some time, and she came to see me once, uh, once a month during family day or twice a month sometimes. She would come see me at family day. I got to see my daughter and she was growing up and started to walk and, and started to talk, and I missed some of those things. But it's all worth it because at the end of this program, I'm now in my apprenticeship, which is like an internship. I graduated the program, and now I stayed on, essentially free labor for them. And I get, when I graduate that, I go home. That's in 37 days, which is a year and four months. And I go home in a month because I submitted to Christ and I asked him to take control, and I spent the whole year getting to know him better. And he's given things back to me one by one. So I'll be home for Christmas. That's right. So now I, I, I turn around, and I, I give other people the hope that I had lost back when I was broken in jail, and I had nothing. I had no hope. I was broken, and there was nothing for me except despair and darkness. That's all I had. They were my best friends in there was sticking with the darkness. But now I have hope and there's reconciliation, there's love, and I'm leading a life that I, I am proud of, one that I can look back and say, I did my best and I did it because Christ was with me. And I got my wife back. And she gets the husband she deserves. My daughter gets the father she deserves. My family gets their brother, their son, cousin, friends. I get to be the man everybody knew I could be if I would just submit. So there's hope, guys. There's hope, but it doesn't happen in one day. It's a journey, but they say seven days in Teen Challenge is like one day anywhere else. So (laughs) you're going to be all right. And I'll see you at the castle. I'll be around. They offered me a job. So I'm going through an internship, and they offered me a job in the IT department. It doesn't happen often, happen, happen often. It's not a popular thing that happens. Usually people have to go through this whole college course thing. But um, before uh, I started getting arrested, I did some college and I did some IT training. And I was trying to use it my whole life, trying to get into IT. And I just could not break down the doors like God was saying no. And then finally, when I submitted, he's given me an opportunity to work in an IT department as an IT specialist and getting paid a decent wage, uh, a good job and a bubble that uh, makes it easy for me to stay on the right track because God knows that addictions don't just go away. It doesn't just go away. You have, to, you have to keep vigilant about your relationship with Christ. You have to keep trying and keep submitting and keep breaking because that's what it takes. It takes all of that. So I'm going to start working there in December. I get to go home and it's all because my wife stuck with it and showed me the love of Christ that I did not know and through her I met Christ as real as it'll ever be. And that's pretty much the story. (laughs) 
I've never actually heard him say his testimony like that to people. And now I don't know how I'm going to sing this last song. Thanks. I need a band, though. <laughs> I do want to quickly give a, a PSA about um, counseling. Counseling, I've been in counseling this whole last year, and um, I used to look at people who were going through counseling and be like, oh, they're in counseling. <laughs> they must have some major issues. <laughs> but it's so not like that. Like, it's been amazing. All counseling is, is they're helping you get the yuck in your heart and bring it to the surface and help you know how to deal with it. And it's been incredible, and it's not something to be shameful about. So if you are struggling with something, or if somebody's struggle is affecting your life, and you need help, like, get help. It's okay. Counseling is not a scary word. It shouldn't be. And that's my two cents. This last song is just exactly where we're at right now. Um, we had major problems. We've worked, we're working through them, worked through a lot of them, and now we move forward with Christ in the center. And uh, we've been through trials, and we've been apart, and now when we come back together in a, just over a month, um, it's definitely going to be different than it was before the last time we were together. We're going to have Christ in the center for the first time of our marriage. And it's going to be a sweet marriage because of it. So this is the last song. Sorry, guys. But hope you enjoy it. Make us whole again.
talked at you guys a lot tonight, but I can't finish this night without saying this. That's my daughter coming towards me. <clears throat> Ricky and I are not naive to think that we're good to go. We've got this, and we're not going to have any more problems. Addiction is powerful, and it's gripping, and it doesn't care what it does to your family. So we move forward in wisdom, and we're putting up precautions and setting boundaries and continuing counseling, the both of us. But we realize that there's somebody in this life who's much more powerful than addiction. He's much more gripping. Once he's got you, he'll never let you go. And he cares what happens to your family. And that's our Lord. When you put Jesus in the center of your life, you're going to discover that life is not without its problems, but it is so much more fruitful and amazing and awesome. For the longest time, we were driving our vehicle by itself, the vehicle of life. We were in the driver's seat. There were several times where Ricky and I were in the driver's seat of the same vehicle at the same time. And that got us nowhere but in the gutter. And when you step back and give up control and submit to the Lord and allow him in the driver's seat, he knows what he's doing. And he's going to lead you someplace that is going to do nothing but give him glory and honor. And that's what we should want in our lives. Giving up control and submitting completely is the only way to give a life that is glorifying and honoring to him. And that's the biggest thing that we've learned through this process. And I'm just so grateful to have a platform to even share that right now. Thank you guys for coming and supporting me, supporting Ricky, our family, and hearing our story of how good God is. That's the theme. God is good all the time. And all the time? Yeah, he is. Let's close this night in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you as sinners. Knowing that it's only through you that we can have true life. Thank you for the sacrifice you provided us so that we may live forever with you. Thank you for the work you've done in my family and the true changes that I've seen in Ricky. I pray, Lord, as we continue this journey, that you'll be with us and you'll lead the way and we'll follow your lead. Thank you for the tools that you've given us to move forward in wisdom. We give this life to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, guys.